Because it's impossible for any road surface to be absolutely level, long ago engineers had to constantly optimize their cars in order to satisfy a comfortable driving experience. There needed to be something between the tires and the passenger to keep the body on a level surface at all times, and today a look at the engineer's solution back then. This is a wheel fitted to the car that can only move up and down. Let the tires forward, encounter bumps up and down adaptive, there will be an instrument above the tire can draw lines to record the track and bumps, so we can see very intuitively when the bumps in the tire's movement amplitude. If we are driving at high speeds, the bumps will be even greater. Now add a relatively stiff spring between the platform and the tire and let's look at it in slow motion. The bumps are reduced because the spring absorbs some of the energy. What if we replace it with a relatively soft spring? The recording instrument presents a gentler bump line because the softer spring provides more cushioning for the bump. The problem becomes more complicated if there are four wheels and two springs, one front and one rear, as in a car. Until now the springs in the front of a car had to be on the stiffer side so that the axle of the wheel in front was in a straight line with the springs. If the front and rear are not aligned, the stiff biased springs will definitely have a greater trajectory. We can see the stiff front and soft rear springs causing huge bumps when they hit bumps. The only way to make a spring softer is to have the spring focus on doing only one thing well, and that is absorbing the energy from the bumps. Suppose we replace the bouncing axle with an immovable crossmember, and the tire is mounted next to two arms parallel to it, and is moving around a point. So even if we hit a bump, the wheel is still perpendicular to the ground and the crossmember. Then the stiff springs are replaced with softer coil springs, making the tires always upright since we use a fixed crossmember and swinging arms. If the front and rear springs are of equal stiffness, the whole is also balanced. But two soft springs can cause problems, as the springs will be overcompressed for huge bumps, and will always have a spring left over for smaller bumps. So the engineers designed a buffer to slow down the whole energy absorption process, which can be interpreted as a brake designed for the spring, so that the spring doesn't wobble excessively. Now we can test it again and see that the trajectory line can be said to be quite smooth. Under slow motion observation, there are no more tough bumps. With the buffer, the soft springs can absorb many shocks that cannot be absorbed perfectly, but of course safety always comes first in practical situations. The engineers have followed this principle to design a durable yet firm suspension. The front wheels are fixed only at the center point so they can steer and have an arm perpendicular to the ground attached to the center point. At the same time the two swing arms are connected to a fixed cross member and the springs are left with the task of absorbing energy. Helping the springs is also the buffer, whose main role is to control the retraction and contraction of the springs. In this way, the combination of soft springs plus buffers can also be used in the rear. By applying the same structure to the rear cross member, you no longer have to worry about car shocks. Let's take a look at the real car test results, which are really quite perfect. Do you know how fast the fastest car in the world really is? This is the world's first car, the Benz Patton Motorwagen, with a speed of 10 miles per hour. This is a 1924 Ford Model T, traveling 40 miles per hour. This is a 1932 Chevrolet Confederate that goes 70 miles per hour. This is a 1964 Rolls-Royce Silver Cloud, going 114 miles per hour. This is a 1970 Lamborghini Miura P400 Hoda, doing 174 miles per hour. This is the BMW M8 Competition, 190 miles per hour. This is an Audi R8, 205 miles per hour. This is a Ferrari La Ferrari, going 217 miles per hour. Next to it is the Lamborghini Aventador SVJ, which does 217 miles per hour. This is the Aston Martin 1-77, and it goes 220 miles per hour. This is the Pagani Zonda R, and it goes 233 miles per hour. This is a Bugatti Devo, and it goes 236 miles per hour. This is the Pagani Huayra, doing 238 miles per hour. This is the Bugatti Centodiasi, and it goes 240 miles per hour. This is a Formula One car with a speed of 248.5 miles per hour. This is the Tesla Roadster, 250 miles per hour. This is the Aston Martin Valkyrie, and it goes 250 miles per hour. This is the Koenigsegg Regera, 250 miles per hour. This is the McLaren Speedtail, capable of 250 miles per hour. This is the SSC Ultimate Aero and it's 257.4 miles per hour. This is the Rimac Nevera, doing 258 miles per hour. This is the Bugatti La Voiture Noire, and it goes 260 miles per hour. This is the Bugatti Mistral, and it goes 261 miles per hour. This is the Zenbo TSR GT, and it goes 263 miles per hour. This is the Bugatti Veyron 16.4 Supersport, and it goes 267.9 miles per hour. This is the Hennessy Venom GT, and it can do 270.5 miles per hour. This is the Koenigsegg 1 colon 1, and it's 273 miles per hour. 
This is the Koenigsegg Adger RS, and it does 278 miles per hour. This is the SSC2 Atara, 286 miles per hour. This is the Koenigsegg CC850, 300 miles per hour. This is the Hennessy Venom F5 Roadster, and it can do 301 miles per hour. This is the Bugatti Chiron Supersport, and it can do 304 miles per hour. This is the Bugatti Bolag, and it goes 310 miles per hour. This is the Koenigsegg Jesco Absolu, traveling at 310 miles per hour. This is the Devil 16, with a top speed of 347 miles per hour, making it the fastest car in the world. Do you know how bizarre the double slit interference experiment is? Many people say it's very scary, while others say it reveals the existence of parallel universes. So what kind of experiment is it? What's so scary about it? And what does it have to do with parallel universes? At the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, physicists have been struggling with a question, is light a particle or a wave? Previously, Newton thought that since light traveled in a straight line and reflected when it met an obstacle, it must be a particle. Given Newton's position in physics at the time, Newton's words were like the Bible, and the particle school, led by Newton carried on throughout the 18th century. Did no one refute him? Of course there was. As early as the 17th century, Hooker put forward the theory of light fluctuations, Huygens also put forward the light fluctuations on its basis, they agreed that light is a kind of wave, light interference phenomenon is the most intuitive proof, two beams of light will produce interference fringe. So the physics community on whether light is a wave or a particle has produced a great deal of disagreement, fluctuation school and particle school have developed their own theories, both sides are convinced that their theories are correct. It was not until the early 19th century that the British physicist Thomas Young designed the Young Interference Experiment. If light is a particle, then when it passes through two slits, only two straight lines corresponding to the slits will appear, but if light is a wave, it is different, it will become two waves and interfere with each other after it passes through two slits, just like two water waves appearing on the surface of a lake at the same time. The result of the experiment was just as Thomas Young had predicted, leaving a zebra-like streak on the screen. His experiment gave the fluctuationists a stage victory and showed the world that authority is not truth. This experiment is easy to understand, and does not seem to have any horror, but later upgraded version to make it full of metaphysical flavor, this is the quantum mechanics of the single particle double slit interference experiment. Because Young's interference experiment uses a continuous mode, a double slit after a burst of emission will appear obvious zebra stripes. The particle school believes that photons are emitted one by one, so how can the experiment be conducted in burst mode? So the physicists switched the photon gun to point-blank mode, which guaranteed that only one photon would be fired at a time, and only one photon would pass through the slit at a time, and it would not be able to interfere with the other photons. It was logical that two parallel streaks should appear on the screen, but the results of the experiment stunned everyone. At first, when the number of photons was small, the light spots on the screen looked disorganized, but as they built up, zebra stripes of light and dark still appeared on the screen. According to the fluctuationists, the zebras originate from the superposition of interference between the two wave sources produced by the double slit, but how does a single photon undergo interferential behavior when it either passes through the slit on the left or the slit on the right? Did a photon split in half as it passed through the double slit and then interfere with itself? Or perhaps a photon passed through both slits at the same time and then interfered? This is the world's tallest apartment to be built in Dubai, which has been named the world's first super tower. A standard apartment here could cost as much as $2 million, and the penthouse, located at the top of the tower, costs even more, as it is said that each apartment on the top floor could sell for more than $200 million. Let's take a look at what kind of magic it has to offer to deserve the $200 million a condo can sell for. This plan to build the world's first height apartment was initially announced in November 2022, and the two investors behind it, one is a company that specializes in high-end real estate development in Dubai, the other specializes in luxury jewelry, and they make watches that are full of personality and creativity, and the price is even more than that, they can be sold for $1 million or more. There are a lot of people who buy these luxury watches from them, including actors, celebrities, singers, including the most familiar one we know, Cristiano Ronaldo. And the two companies built this property with the aim of making him the most luxurious and expensive apartment in the world. It's located in Dubai's most affluent business district, near the largest wildlife sanctuary, and the Burj Khalifa. If you are lucky enough to live on the top floor of this place, then you will enjoy an array of premium services such as private guards, luxury chauffeurs, and even a private chef, a private aquarium, an infinity pool, and a private gym. Also at the top of its tower is a jewel-encrusted crown, and when it's completed, the scent of the gems glittering above will be visible from 800 miles away in the desert. To create its uniqueness, it must be taller and have more floors than the current tallest residential building in the world, Central Park. 
So will the building sell when it's completed? We have to look at its competitor, the world's tallest residential building, Central Park, located in New York City. The Central Park Tower is nearly 500 meters tall, due for completion in 2021, and will ultimately cost over $3 billion to build. The average apartment in it costs $22 million, which is higher than the Super Tower to be built in Dubai. Apartments on the top floors go on sale in 2022 at a starting price of $250 million, but half of them remain unsold so far, with more wealthy people preferring a freestanding home with a courtyard and garden. And it's not only in New York City that apartments in such high-rises don't sell well, several high-rises over here in Dubai have half their floors still unsold. As we can see from the competition for the Super Tower, the building probably won't sell particularly well once it's built, so why would these two companies build such a luxurious super condo? This brings us to the philosophy and the products designed by their two companies. The character of their companies is all about individuality, luxury, and bold design, which is why they can build million-dollar watches and still sell them. The same goes for this super tower, if it was easy to build then the super rich probably wouldn't buy it, instead the more difficult they make this project the more those potential super rich will buy their product. So how many apartments do you think this super tower Dubai is building will sell in the future? Would you be willing to pay $2 million to live in it if it were you?